Good evening, everyone. I'm Tracy Noah from the Marion Library Service. Welcome to our Library Through the Lens live webinar, part of our series of adult programs delivered differently. This evening, thanks to Affirm Press, we welcome Melbourne-based author John Byron as he talks about his book, The Tribute, the most original thriller of 2021, which heralds John as a formidable new player in Australian crime writing. John grew up in Sydney, where he went to med medical school for a time before leaving in the interests of public safety. He now lives in Melbourne and works in the university sector. His writing has appeared in The Australian, The Australian Book Review, The Conversation, Time Out and Rip It Up. The Tribute is his first novel and was shortlisted for the Victoria Premier's Literary Award for an unpublished manuscript in 2019. Please feel free at any time during the presentation to type questions you have for John into the Q&A or chat feeds on your screen and he will answer these at the end of his talk. Now please sit back, grab a cuppa or a glass of wine and please welcome our special guest, John Byron. Thanks Tracy and g'day everybody. Um, it's great to be with you. Thanks for joining this evening and um, special mention to uh, shout out to some family. Um, I've got quite a bit of family on both sides in Adelaide. So um, thanks for coming along as well. Um, I'm coming to you from Wurundjeri country in Melbourne. I live in, in Fitzroy, just um, north of the city. And, uh, but I wrote this book all over the joint. I wrote bits of it in Adelaide. I wrote quite a bit of it in Sydney um, and Melbourne and Brisbane, New York even, uh, Amsterdam, I think. So it's, um, I owe a lot of debts to people whose land I've worked on. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be able to bring it all together for you tonight. So um, as Tracy mentioned, um, uh, the, the book is set in Sydney and, um, and I grew up there and went to uni there um, for a few years to Sydney Uni to study medicine. And, um, and those of you who've, who've read it or have got an idea about um, what, it's, what it's about, will see that there's quite a lot of anatomical um, knowledge in there. And that's, that's kind of going back to my, my sort of late teens and early twenties when I was a medical student and um, back in Sydney. Uh, and, but it's also a kind of a, a maybe slightly dark love letter to Sydney. It's my hometown, it'll always be my hometown. May never live there again, I don't know, but, um, but I grew up there and I have a lot of affection for Sydney and, uh, and I know it pretty well. So um, one of the things I was keen to do in this book is to, is to really place it in, in a real geographical space and focus on um, how people experience their lives, not just with the events that are going on, but also the spaces they're moving through. And uh, that includes the time of year. So there's a bit of weather in there and, um, and the flora and the fauna. And, uh, and hopefully if you know Sydney, you might find some, um, the, you know, pleasant shock of recognition of, um, of a favourite view uh, in there at some point um, in the various parts. I, I did get pretty well all over town in this book, um, even up to the Blue Mountains. So, um, but first I'm gonna just give you a little bit of a rundown of the, of the plot outline. And um, because this is kind of a little bit, um, you know, me just talking to you at first and I'm, as, the, as the overhead says, please do send in any questions you've got because even if, um, even before Q&A at the end, because it'll help me sort of steer things into the direction of things that you want to hear about. Um, but I'll give you a little plot outline, hopefully not too many spoilers, because there will be some people who haven't read it yet. Uh, and, and then we'll move on to this, the usual questions about that I have, that I've learned that people are interested in. I'll just talk about a few of those things, um, you know, the process and so on. Um, so the premise of the book is that there's um, a, a a serial killer who is um, reenacting uh, dissections from a 16th century um, foundation anatomy text called the Fabrica um, by Andreas Vesalius. And Vesalius published this, um, this book uh, at the age of 28. Uh, he was already a professor of anatomy at Padua University. And he went to Basel in Switzerland and published this book, which was basically actually the, um, the written version of a series of lectures that he gave. And the lectures were, um, were involved in live dissections, live meaning in person, I don't mean of living people, um, they, were, they were dead people, but just to be clear. Um, but uh, so the, the book is in seven volumes. Um, one, you know, they've sort of worked in different systems. So the first one's the bones, the second one's the muscles. Uh, and so on. It goes nerves and, and, and veins and arteries um, 
and the brain and uh, and the heart and lungs. So each each killing is is a kind of a reenactment of um, of this, these um, dissections in the book. And you know the, the cops pretty much figure that out fairly quickly. So it's not a major spoiler to tell you that that's that's what's going on. Um, and in the book, I try to capture the voice of um, of the protagonist as well as the people who are hunting for him. Um, because I've always been a bit interested in that question of, um, of how, particularly in the movies, how people handle motivation uh, for, for these things. And, and I decided that I was going to have this, this serial killer was going to be a quite um, scholastic sort of fellow. He's, he's really, he's completely um, sublimated his interest in anatomy in, to the point where he ceases to see these people as people and they're, um, they're objects of study for him. And uh, so he's, he's working away on this, uh, the, the homicide. He's very, very good at preparation. He has an uncanny um, ability to identify, uh, you know, the, the periods of safety when he can go in and, and get his victims alone for enough time to, to conduct these dissections in their homes. And, um, and they just can't figure out that he just doesn't give them anything to work with. He leaves nothing behind and um, they're having a really hard time. And so the, the homicide detective, um, uh, Detective Senior Sergeant David Murphy, otherwise known as Spud Murphy, um, Spud uh, gets pretty frustrated and uh, he's, got a, he's got a very good um, conversion rate um, and he doesn't want to put that at risk. Um, there's political pressure, there's an election coming up. Uh, so the police minister's on his case and um, he decides he better get it done. And there's a suggestion that maybe they need to look at some um, alternative ways of doing the, the crime scenes. And he, he ropes in his sister, who is an art historian at Sydney Uni, um, who specialises in the history of the depiction of the body. And she knows this book uh, as part of her expertise. And, um, and, and in fact, she was... Um, early on to the case about thinking that it might be um, a reenactment of the Fabrica. And so she comes in and gets involved in the, in the investigation. And then we get, we, we then sort of get further into the family, the Murphy family, the, the detective, his wife uh, and his sister. And, um, and things are uh, tense in that world as well. And that's, that becomes an increasingly important part of the narrative. I won't say too much more about that. But uh, eventually those two uh, streams collide at the end. Um, so, so that's, that's the outline. Uh, and, um, you know, the, I'm often asked, how did you come up with this obsession with the Fabrica? You know, uh, why, why this book? You know? um, and the, the reason where it first lodged itself into my mind is that I was, I was in med school at Sydney from um, 86 to 88. And uh, one of the summers in there, I can't remember which one now, but um, I was working over the summer at, um, at an RSL club in Western Sydney. And um, there was a bloke there who was a full-time barman and um, kind of assistant manager kind of thing um, of this little RSL club. And he, um, you know, he was sort of in his, he was a bit older than me, sort of in his late 20s, I guess. Um, and he had a bit of a punk aesthetic going. Um, and, you know, he came to work with, sort of chains and, and leather jacket with studs and all this kind of stuff. Um, but he was a really, really amazingly talented artist. He could, he could just hand draw the most incredible things. Like he's just, just stand there chatting to you while he's chatting, he's sketching you and presenting you with this, these beautiful likenesses and, um, and, and also things from memory. It didn't even have to be in front of him. And so um, he had this... Um, when he found out I was a medical student, he's like, have you ever heard of Andreas Vesalius and the Fabrica? And I said, well, sure, you know, they teach us that in both in anatomy itself, but we also had this great subject called the history and philosophy of medicine. And we did quite a lot of that uh, in, in there because the, the Fabrica is kind of the, um, a text that really revolutionised how anatomy was done in, in Europe, at least, um, after about a thousand years of, um, of stasis you know, from the classical era. And, um, and so, you know, of course, I, I knew of it, and, uh, but he was really into it, like I'm saying, really into it. And, and he would stand there talking about, um, about the book and its woodcuts and, uh, and then drawing from memory these incredible likenesses 
of, of the many beautiful uh, diagrams inside um, the Fabrica um, of, of, you know, anatomical parts. And, uh, and you know, and he was a slightly scary guy, so it was kind of a little bit freaky at the same time, but also sort of that, that sort of obsession really lodged in my mind. And, and, um, and even though I left med school um, a couple of years later, once I realised I didn't really want to be a doctor, <laughs> I was... I didn't mind the study um, of the science of medicine, but I didn't really, I just realised once we got into the hospitals that I was probably going to be a liability. You wouldn't really want to be treated by someone who wasn't fully committed to that profession. And um, I thought it was best for everybody if I left. Uh, but, you know, I, that sort of obsession with this guy and the talent he had, which was sort of didn't really have much other outlet at that time in his life. He was just doing this other job for money and wasn't really pursuing his art all that much, but he clearly had this frustrated profound ability and uh and it sort of channeled into this into this obsession with the book and so i'm not saying he was a, a psycho or anything like that at all um but uh but the, the pitch of that obsession and it's and it's um intensity and the focus of it it was in very clear focus this uh, this obsession with the book and so that kind of stuck with me and i, I took that into um i guess i thought over the years you know about what what would that look like if it developed into something um, more unwholesome, I guess? Um, and so, you know, the, the, not long after I left med school, I, I washed up in Townsville at one point and um, I entered a, um, a local short story competition, it didn't do any good, but uh, the story had in it um, this one little idea for a, a climax at the end of the story uh, that I have that, that is now in the climax of this of this novel, and so the the, the longest lived single part of the writing um, dates from that 1990 uh, short story. So the the gestation of this book, the elements of it, is very very long. Uh, much of it, I didn't really um, get around to writing um, until until sort of five or six years ago, is when I did write the first draft of it. But uh, over the years, I. I didn't even realise I was doing it. It was just the kind of, I would go back and think about this plot while I was, you know, out walking or on a plane or, you know, driving a car and you're just gathering wool, you know, just sort of thinking random stuff. And I just kept coming back to this. And, it, and over many years, the thing developed into this incredibly complex, um, you know, clockwork mechanism of a story. And the point came where I thought, I really better write this down because, you know, it was, bursting out of my head and it's there's quite a lot in it you know it's a 400 page novel um the the version that the draft that was shortlisted for the victorian premier's literary award was uh, quite a lot longer than this um, i regret to say sorry about that judges um so you know there's quite a lot of content and i needed to get it down so i started writing that um and i just i guess i because i already had a clear idea about what i wanted to do plot wise and i also had a fairly good I'd already thought more than I'd realised about who the people were, who the characters were in this. It kind of flowed pretty easily, um, especially when I allowed myself just to get out of my own way. When, it's, when it comes time to sit down, you, you've got a scene where you know that person X and person Y are in the scene and you have to achieve outcome A by means B. And that's not a lot to go on, actually, when you're sitting down to write actual words, actual dialogue. Um, and so... Uh, Maybe I should have been, maybe I was naive or something and it helped, but uh, maybe I should have been more nervous about that. But I just sat down and it just kind of flowed. And I think the reason it flowed is that I entrusted the story, which I was pretty clear on plot points wise, I entrusted the story to the characters because I knew who they were and I knew what they would do and how they would speak and, and that kind of thing. And so, um, and of course, you have to develop the characters. You can't just blurt it out all at the beginning. Uh, there's one particular character where I had to be quite careful about um, about revealing elements of that character's personality not too soon. And I didn't get that right at the beginning. I had that was probably the major thing that changed in the many edits that I did. Um, but you know, basically, you just follow the characters, and if they if they're real people in your mind, uh, they will show you how they take you on the journey that the plot requires you to go on. So, uh, so it was just a really, um, a very pleasurable exercise. Um, and, uh, and I highly recommend it to, to everybody. If you've, if you've been thinking about 
writing, just just start, you know. Uh, it's just such an enjoyable process. And especially if you don't have to worry too much about, you don't have a deadline, that's awesome. Um, you know, don't worry about the page being blank. Just put something on it and it's not blank anymore. Uh, and you can always edit it later. And, and I did a lot of edits of this. Um, you know, there were sort of eight major drafts. Um, draft six was the one that went to the, the Premier's Award and then we did two more. Um, I did another one with my agent, Catherine Drayton. Um, we did a whole full new draft before we even took it to market. Uh, and then another really big overhaul once, um, once a firm um, picked it up and, uh, and I had a copy edited with them. And, and um, so Martin Hughes, the publisher there, had, had quite a few good ideas, one pretty crucial one especially and then Ruby Ashby Orr who was my copy editor just did this beautiful job um, working back and forth with me on you know quite a few iterations in that eighth draft so there are sentences in in this book that I will have read over without any exaggeration like many hundreds of times um, and and you know probably I didn't need too much tweaking after the first few dozen but uh, you know some of it's pretty was new that was sort of lobbed in near the end but um, but not much of that so it's had that's the good thing about with not to preempt um, Charlotte Wood's session that that I know she's coming to the library next week, but um, you know she's she's kind of the guru of um, you know the one woman Paris Review for Australia. She's incredible. Um, you know she knows a lot about the art and craft of writing. Um, but my my sort of when people say to me, oh, "What do you do about writer's block?" and so just start. You know you don't really know what you need to find out until you've started to write, and uh, you don't let the blank page intimidate you. Just um, just mark it up and then keep going and then and then trust yourself to edit later on. So that's that's kind of where the, the story came from. I had a lot of beta readers that helped me out, different drafts, earlier drafts that friends that said they would read it for me and give me critique, which was which is very generous. Um, particularly uh, it's it can be difficult to ask that of people who don't want to hurt your feelings. And especially when it's your first go out, um, they, they don't want to, you know, burst your bubble. And I, I understand that I would be the same way, but um, you know, I had to kind of reassure people, tell me I really want to know, you know, are you, are you going to let me walk out on stage with my fly undone or are you going to just say awkwardly, mate, your fly's undone? You know, I'd rather you tell me now before I get on the Opera House you know, concert hall stage. Uh, and so that's that's the process that you go through and, um, and people were very generous. Um, you know, my partner, Julianne, read this many times. Um, sorry about that, Julianne. Uh, including heroically on one Trans-Pacific flight, and um, Julian can sleep on planes, and and chose not to to um, to read one of my drafts, which was a great act of generosity. Um, and so, you know, the, it's a bit of a bit of a team effort. It's not just a solo gig. You know, there's no such thing as a solo album, and that's certainly true of writing. Um, yeah, so that's that's how we got there. But you know, there are a lot of bits of my life, my bizarre kind of like post uh, school working life that have ended up in this book in different ways and one of them is um, that I lived for a while in Adelaide and I did my BA in Adelaide I uh, spent five very happy years at the University of Adelaide there and lived um, you know in different parts of town and I worked at the Bank of South Australia um, computer centre out at Kidman Park um, as a help desk operator and um, that found its way in a pretty major way into the book so it's not just the med school background and then I spent a bit of time working in federal politics and although there's not really much about that in there there is one uh, one or two there are one or two scenes in there with um with politicians in there that I uh, had a little bit of fun with and that I hope you enjoy um so you know you just bring in bits and pieces of different parts of your life that that feel relevant or or they've got something to add um I wasn't sort of cramming things in gratuitously I don't think but um and in fact Ruby wouldn't have let me get away with that but you know the it's just that you can be resourceful and, and and speak more truthfully, I guess, from things that are within your own experience a little bit. And uh, but it's it's a big part of what's what's enjoyable about it. So I'm just going to have a look at a few questions that I've got coming in here. Um, there was one saying, "Who are some of my favourite crime writers? And are there any traces of their influence?" Well, um, there's there's a couple of this is just the beginning. There's this whole catastrophe of a bookshelf in the other room. Um, but some of my favourite crime writers are, in, are, are behind me and other writers as well. Um, there is uh, an element of, um, of gendered violence that, that becomes a, a, a key part of this novel. And uh, so there are books in that sort of domain, quite serious books in that domain. 
that are part of it, including and, and having mentioned Charlotte Wood, um, the natural way of things is, you know, one of the best things anybody's written in this country for quite a long time. I think it's an amazing novel. Um, so that's one of them. But in terms of crime, um, I've got quite a, I read pretty broadly. Um, I, you know, I've got an English degree, I've got two English degrees, um, you know, uh, sort of did a pretty straightforward double major in English at, uh, at Adelaide as part of my BA got first class honours and won a university medal. So I probably did all right there. But, but you know, you've got to study the whole lot down when you do those kinds of courses. So, um, and so I've, you know, I've got a, a real love of, um, you know, Shakespeare uh, as well as, as crime. And, um, you know, I read some science fiction and, and you know, I, I love espionage novels, um, but I also, you know, love Jane Austen and, uh, and you know, Patrick White is, picture of Patrick White up there, you can just see in the corner there. Um, you know, so I've got lots of different tastes and they probably all do end up in there. Um, specifics though, uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's traditional to quote um, Raymond Chandler and the, the reason might be it's a bit like Freud perhaps, you know, we're all Freudians in some way, whether we know it or not. And I think every crime writer has got a bit of Chandler in them. Um, even though he's, he's got these pretty wacky plots, but um, he's just got such a great observation of human characters. Um, but, you know, less known people like George V. Higgins, I'm, I'm pretty keen on, uh, Don Winslow and George Pelicanos, you know, anybody who has had it, Richard Price, anything, anybody who had anything to do with the, the writing of the, of the television series The Wire, um, I, I pretty much read what they write in print um, because that's an, it's an amazing TV show and they pull together the most incredible writer's room for that, uh, for those five uh, seasons of that show. And uh, so I've, I got right writing to those guys for, for a while. I think I've probably read everything they publish now though. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of, I guess I lean a little bit more to the harder edge and to the noir end. end. Um, I don't really... Um, you know, I'm not, I don't mind, I've read my fit share of, um, of Sherlock Holmes, but I probably won't go back there. Um, but, uh, and, you know, but even, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the Simenon novels, you know, the uh, Magritte is not really my, my kind of guy, but, um, but some of the non-Magritte Simenon novels are amazing, you know, um, Dirty Snow and Three Bedrooms in Manhattan. Some of that stuff I read for tone as much as anything. Um, Jonathan Ames wrote a very short, novella recently um, called You Were Never Really Here. It's made into a film. It's quite confronting, but it's just got incredible tone. Uh, and, and some of that I've just recently reread to try to get that sense of, um, of kind of existential dread almost. Uh, and there's a, there's a Japanese guy um, named um, Fuminori Nakamura, um, who's, who's written The Thief and uh, The Kingdom is another one from, from him who I recommend. Uh, and so, you know, I, I do look around um, quite a bit, you know, Leonardo Shaka from, um, for, from Italy. Um, you know, there's, there's quite a few that I, I love, but I'm, I'm pretty eclectic. And I guess my, um, you know, people say to me, you know, what, what, what's the, you know, how do I go about becoming you know, equipped to, to write and there's, there's nothing like reading. You know, I, I reckon um, that read widely as you can, but also read in depth in the genre that you're most interested in, that you're interested in writing into. And so um, I think that's, the, that, that's one of the, um, you know, both just read and just write um, are, the, are the, uh, the best tips for, for people who are wanting to write. And so, you know, in terms of influences, there's, you know, Harold Bloom, the, the um, late... Uh, literary critic um, has this has it well. It's the title of one of his books, "The Anxiety of Influence." And people do get terribly bound up with the question of of influence. You know, are they? Where do you go? Where do you draw the line between homage and plagiarism? You know, how is it is it even embarrassing to admit that people are your influences? And I don't think it is. I think you don't necessarily have to be trying to nod and wink to your audience, but I think it's okay for things to be in there um, that are. That are a straight line from from something else, a little bit of a nod to something that's been important to you, uh, and you know it's actually a little bit of a gift to to your readers. Um, you know, my friend Andrew Netty, who's a, who's a crime writer, he lives here in Melbourne as well. Um, you know, his his last novel, Gunshine State, he's got a new one about to come out, but his last one, Gunshine State, um, has a scene in it that I won't spoil it for you if anybody wants to read it, but uh, a scene in it right near the end that is very reminiscent and deliberately so 
of um, of, a, of a key and vivid scene in um, in the TV series Blue Murder uh, about Nettie Smith and um, Roger Rogerson and all those guys in New South Wales back back in the day. And um, and you know, I remember saying to Andrew, I, I like the Blue Murder reference, and he goes, Oh yeah, you got that. He said a few people, you know, a few people get that one, but it's just a little bit of a present for an Easter egg for for anybody who's playing along at home and, and has some of the same uh, books on their bookshelf that, that the author does. And so, you know, it is a, writing is, a, is interactive. It's not just sitting alone in your garret writing out into a vacuum. You know, there is a, there is a um, it, you know, I'm writing, I write this book because it's the kind of thing I like to read, um, but I know that there are plenty of other people out there like me. So, um, you know, that's, that's partly where you, you just have to, um, you just have to go with that. Uh, I've got another question here. What is the motivation of the murderer? Um, that's a really good question, and I've been um, I've been asked in different ways about that, including um, people who don't like the fact that I actually don't really go into that too much, and there is a reason that I don't go into it too much. Um, the I guess people have probably read. Um, a lot of people who are reading a book like this or interested in a book like this have probably read Thomas Harris or they've at least seen Silence of the Lambs and uh, and the and um, uh, Red Dragon, the novel that preceded Silence of the Lambs that became Manhunter. Um, you know, the the thing about the bad guys in both of those novels is there's this kind of um, attempt to psychologise their pathology uh, that's supposedly their motivation for doing terrible things and in the course of trying to explain them um, what happens is that um, you know it's there's a risk that an author can demonize a section of, com of a community if they view them as being uh, prone to um, to a particular disturbance that can result in a believable pathology to the point where someone starts killing multiple people, and um, and I didn't really I didn't want to go down that road. I was really careful to not do that, and so I didn't really seek to to give an elaborate motivation other than this kind of over intellectual, dry, alienated from human compassion kind of um, approach. And I don't think you have to look too far. Uh, in society to find people who are um, in whatever their field is who have lost track of the fact that it's real people that um, that are at stake uh, you know it could be as I mean there's a, there's a hunters and collectors song called what's a few men and the and it's in the voice of um, you know ge a general in the I think the First World War, um, talking about, you know, just, just send another wave, what's a few men, you know, we, it doesn't matter, just send another wave over the top um, and, okay, they get mown down by the Turkish machine guns, but we just have to keep hammering, them, you know. That kind of blithe um, callousness about that these are human beings that you're talking about. Um, people who talk about economics in terms of, um, you know, there's, there's the, the rhetoric of lifters and leaners, um, not too long ago, and 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 you know, dull bludgers and this kind of thing, where where these are people who are struggling. They don't have the advantages that the that the people who are commenting on them have had in their lives, and and it's um, you know I think it's it's really ethically fraught to to forget that they that there are human beings at the other end of this. But it's very common, and so my my serial killer is one of these people who has lost sight of. Uh, the fact he's done it in a lethal way, and it's not it's not as um, you know it's it's kind of more crimey, I guess, than than the way we see all the time. But you know, any you can pick up any newspaper any day and find the trace in in something someone said in there of of a person who's lost sight of the fact that when they're advocating that um, well, these are just the market conditions that we have to bear to to stick to a certain kind of ideology about how we run economics. And forget that there are real humans who's who are going to lose their homes, are going to lose their jobs, um, and 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 that's that's profoundly you know it, it's it's actually unfortunately a, a really a pretty commonplace thing. So it didn't feel to me such a stretch to have um, a guy who's kind of literalizing that callousness, that lack of empathy, um, because unfortunately I see evidence of it in in our society, and we kind of accept it um, unfortunately, and so. Um, 
so that's why I didn't want to, the, 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 two, the twin reasons I didn't want to go into too much detail about, I didn't want to make him, you know, um, a repressed anything because the, whatever category you pick, uh, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of pointing the finger at, at people who are um, non-mainstream as though they are more inclined to become murderously, you know, homicidal. Well, sorry, that's the tautology, but, you know, murderously obsessed. And, uh, and I doubt that there are those associations. And so I wasn't going to get into that, into that pattern. Um, so I, I can't spot and I thought there was another question there, but I might have lost it. Um, do, I, do people have other questions that you'd want to that you'd want to get into. Uh, here we go. Um, oh, Guy Healy. Hi, Guy. Um, can I take the very first germination of my idea for the book? How did it evolve? Well, I, I sort of did go into that a little bit, but um, yeah, that obsession, the, the guy with the obsession, um, in terms of tying it to, uh, to the crisis in the family, uh, in the homicide detective's family. I'm trying to be a little careful here because there will be people who haven't yet read it and I don't want to uh, go too far um, unpicking. But um, the, the, the sort of final showdown, the Mexican standoff, the three-way Mexican standoff, if you like, at the end of at the book, which um, people will be correct if they detect a, a resonance from the uh, a, a closing scene in The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. Um, but the, the standoff in there um, kind of requires there to, to, for one of the characters to have, um, to have a, a, a motivation to have, um, to have steered the, the events in a particular way. I'm being too vague, aren't I? Um, it's very annoying, but I'm trying not to, to spoil the, the, the ending. But, you know, the, I, I had to find a, a really strong motivation and one of the things that has been that we've been it's been going on the whole time but that we've become a lot more aware of in recent times is this absolute epidemic of domestic and family violence that uh, has been accepted to the point where people used to brag about doing these things to their to their you know their children and their and their partners and um and you know now it's obviously not the kind of thing that people will, will skite about but it still goes on and and I'm not convinced that it's necessarily um, going down in very much in, um, in incidents that hopefully the reporting proportion of reporting is getting greater, but, um, but, you know, the figures are still pretty worrying. And, and so, but we've got a lot of consciousness about it now and it's the thing that sort of people are talking about. And so bringing in that family violence side of it um, satisfied the plot requirement for a motivation, but it also met my need to, to write a book that tried to intervene in the culture in some way, to, to sort of, to, sort of show, to speak frankly about something that used to be not talked about all that much. And, that, um, and I thought it was also important for um, a male voice to do that too, not that there aren't any others at all, but, um, but it is predominantly women who are the activists in that domain, even though fundamentally it's, a, it's men's problem. You know, it's men that are overwhelmingly the perpetrators of, of this kind of behaviour. And so it seemed important to me that, that, that men take collective responsibility for changing the culture that enables that behaviour. I'm not suggesting that writing a book will, you know, as a one-to-one -one direct line, um, you know, stop someone from, from, from hitting their wife or girlfriend or their child. But, um, but I think it can help open a discussion in the community about the kinds of things we won't accept and and that the, the tolerance of the culture is a large part of why people act with impunity not just in that domain but in other things as well and and so you know if, if you live in a culture that accepts that that politicians or public servants are just corrupt all the time well that's corruption is what you're going to get but if you live in a place where you just say that that's just not acceptable and you prosecute that and you make a big deal of it and you don't say isn't it a shame that it's that it's um, a, a perfectly good career has been spoiled just because um, a person, you know, is is corrupt? Well, that's I'm sorry, that's not a perfectly good career if you're behaving in that way. And it's the same thing with with men um, being violent at home. Um, you know, they might seem like the good bloke or the great boss or the you know terrific um, professional in whatever field they're in. But if if they're doing that kind of stuff, they're not a great guy. And I think it's good, it's really healthy to, to sort of have a discussion about that. And so that was one of my, um, 
motivations for for that that strand in the in the story. Um, as far as how hard was the preparation, I love doing this. I just I didn't find it work at all. It took a long time because you know I, I was making a living in the meantime, and um, some days you don't write much, uh, and you know you or you sometimes you require a day or two to get into the swing of it and then you're away um so this so you know the the facts of life you know having to having to earn a crust um you know distracted me from it but um but that's about the only hard thing i mean i really enjoyed the whole process and uh, i kind of feel like i was made to do it um you know not very many people make a living writing full time in Australia, unfortunately, but um, it's just not enough of us here. Um, 25 million people and whatever proportion of that are, are readers of adult fiction, um, it's not enough. But, um, but you know, I wouldn't mind having a crack at it. <laughs> if you can tell everybody to go buy the book, uh, you know, to, to bring that to fruition, I will deliver. I'm, I'm writing again right now. I've got two or three other projects all um, banked up right, waiting to go. And uh, I just absolutely love the process. Um, and was it an individual or a social process? Um, well, there is the you know there is the stuff about how you how you sit down and dream these things up in your in your own mind, and you've got to ultimately need you need a bit of solitude and quiet to get it down. But um, I like working in cafes. I like I like people around me because um, I just feel that's part of. Um, I don't really like the being quite so isolated. I think going out in the middle of nowhere and doing it wouldn't suit me at all. Um, but it's also the kind of thing that lots of conversations with friends and colleagues and family, um, you know, end up influencing how I thought about elements of the plot. And so um, it is a social, deeply social process. And, and I'm always aware that it's, it's for an audience. I mean, I didn't have a book contract when I wrote this draft. Um, and, uh, and in fact, even entering it in the unpublished manuscript um, prize from the Victorian Premiers Awards was, um, was an idea that that friend Andrew Nettie um, put in my head, um, which is a very good and timely one. But even then, I was I was kind of writing it just to write it because I I had this idea for this thing that would be the kind of book I would really like to pick up and read. And um, but but even then, I didn't necessarily have a single ideal reader uh, in mind, like a particular person um, that I was thinking, okay, I'm writing for them. Um, but I I had a, a kind of um, an abstracted concept of, of a readership and I thought oh well people someone's going to read this book I mean there are there are a lot of readers like me out there so I figured that it would have that audience and so I did set out to entertain and uh and to and to sort of you know build the narrative and to and to make people not be able to put it down um I um I've actually had quite a bit of feedback on on how um you know it's a bit of a page turner especially towards the end and in fact, I had um, had one funny text message one morning from um, the chief of staff of a, of a very senior um, Australian politician who um, who sent me a text saying, um, my kids are cranky with you this morning. And I was like, oh, really? <laughs> Why is that? And she said, um, well, I was up until 3 a.m. finishing your bloody book, and so I've been grumpy all morning and so, um, you know, annoyed the children. But um, I've heard, heard quite a bit of that sort of stuff. So... Uh, and including people reading it in a single day and single set, uh, session and that kind of thing. So um, just be warned, don't, um, don't pick it up for, um, for a quick read at, you know, at quarter to 12 um, if you've got to get up early in the morning. So, um, but that was part, that's by design. You know, I really wanted to entertain readers. I mean, I, I, like, um, I like fiction that's got a social purpose but also got a, a really strong through line as a, as a plot. Um, that have got characters that are believable. I don't necessarily have to like them. I, I happen to like a couple of the characters a lot in this book, but I don't necessarily need that myself as a as a writer. But I've got to believe in them. I've got to, I've got to find their actions credible for what that kind of person in that situation would do. Um, so I guess um, you know I, I was trying to reproduce those kinds of things, and then then give some sort of narrative momentum. Um, you know in the back half uh, where it sort of races away to a, to a, a crescendo, um, I really wanted to sort of pick, pick that pace up. Uh, so hopefully I've, I've achieved that. But the, just, just quickly on the characters, um, on the likability question, um, I got asked by, um, I did a podcast with, with Booktopia and um, 
you know, they they asked me where did I get the, the there's two main female characters in there, and where, where did I get them from? And in particular, the main protagonist, the art historian, Joe. And um, you know, I hadn't really thought about it until they sort of asked me that question, like sort of live to air. And um, but it was it was really interesting just to realise I had this moment of realisation sitting there with my two interlocutors, um, and uh, that that. You know, Joe really is an amalgam of, of a bunch of really amazing women in my life um, that I've known over the years. Um, and many of them are humanities scholars in, in different disciplines. Uh, you know, my, my, back, my academic background is in, is in English literature and, um, and a bit of history, a bit of politics, um, a bit of philosophy. And then I did a PhD at, at Sydney Uni and, uh, and had a lot to do with other um, people across the whole arts faculty as a postgrad, and um, and you know they're, they're dear friends and, and women that I really admire, and they're they're great feminists. Um, they're really smart. They're articulate. They're funny, uh, and I just I, I love them. And I you know I just I just really like being around them. And so I guess Joe is just um, sort of a, a, a mashup of um, of a bunch of people who I, I really like and appreciate. And so that. Perhaps that warmth is part of why that character feels so vivid to people um, who've, who've told me that. So, um, you know, that, that's, that's the, they were the easy characters to write. And Sylvia, her sister-in-law, is, uh, is a nurse, but is, um, is a woman who uh, had a tough background. I, I wrote a whole lot of backstory for, for a few of these characters that doesn't appear in the, in the book, but it was important for me to write it to really understand who they are. Uh, and, and Sylvia's childhood was was pretty tough and she got herself out of that scenario as a, as a teenager and really took charge of her life and um, and and she too has elements of people like I won't name but I could name um, that who I admire and love and so um, they were the they were the characters I really enjoyed writing um, not everybody was like that I did not enjoy writing uh, the character of the, of the serial killer as I, as I hope um, might be you would expect um, but um, but I he was a, he was a type that I I wanted to to express uh, rather than anybody. It wasn't based on any person I knew, but he was a kind of a, a fictional type that I thought I could channel and uh, and served a really useful purpose. And then the homicide detective, complicated guy, highly decorated, uh, you know, a knockabout bloke, larrikin, short fuse, but you know, but tough but fair, salt of the earth, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so, but but with you know a dark streak, and so um, you know he was easily the hardest one to write, and he was the one I had to work on again and again and again uh, to get it right. So um, there's another question here. Given this is my debut novel, um, can I tell you a bit about how my readers have responded to it and how that's felt? Um, was I nervous about meeting my readership, and has it been a good ride? Um, thanks, Julianne. Um, yeah, the. Um, it's been great, and um, and uh, the responses I've had have been along the lines of you know the great page turner, very different things people have responded to. Some people have really really been um, uh, moved by the um, by especially a bloke talking about the family violence question and and, and how that's treated in the and exposed, and you know the associated behaviours of coercive control and, and those kinds of things, and. Um, and, and some people have just said, oh, you know, I, I got this really nice email from a, a bloke in, in Ireland who said, um, you know, I read, I read your book online, uh, I mean, you know, in an e-book version, and he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to get the physical copy mailed to me now because, you know, I loved it so much. And I lived in Sydney back in, you know, 2003 or whatever, um, you know, in my, in my gap year and then, you know, came back here and haven't been back to Australia since. And I'm bloody coming again, you know, because he just, he just loved the, the depiction of Sydney that really resonated for him. And, you know, different people have responded to different, different parts of it. But it's been, um, it's been really great. I mean, I've had some, some really nice reviews in the media uh, and really good responses by professional book people. Um, and, you know, and it's selling reasonably well, especially for a book that was launched immediately before a massive lockdown, which hasn't helped with promoting it. Um, but, but all that stuff is nothing compared to getting uh, wrapped feedback from real readers, you know, people who just say, I just have to tell you, I just finished your book and I bloody loved it. And it's just, that just is everything, you know, it's just so, 
rewarding and it feels a little bit indecently rewarding given that I really enjoyed just the process of writing it to begin with. This book owed me nothing when I, when I published it. Uh, it owes my publisher a fair bit, but it doesn't owe me anything. I already had what I needed from it um, when we got it out there into the world. And, and to then get, get that, those responses from people has just been fantastic. And, you know, even, the, even some of the negative responses I had, you know, I had this, um, there's, a, there's a comment on one of the audiobook um, outlets where there's um, a very grumpy fellow insisting that I'm, that I'm um, a woman, not just a woman, but a feminazi, um, writing under a pseudonym, man-hating, whatever. Uh, and, uh, and great, you know, if, if there's a bloke like that who, who's, who thinks so much about male supremacy that he's motivated to get cranky enough to write that, um, I'm doing something right. So even, even some of the negative critique has been all right with me. Um, and now I've got another question here. Is uh, the hero's journey relevant to me um, or more dramatic need of characters or some other model? Um, I didn't, I mean, you know, you can't really do uh, much in, in film and literary studies without coming across Joseph Campbell. <clears throat> so um, clearly that's in my background, um, that sort of hero's journey kind of concept. As well as, you know, the sagas and, you know, it's been going for a long time. It's not just... Um, the hero with a thousand faces, but um, I didn't self-consciously model um, this trajectory. And I think one of the reasons is that it doesn't have a single central protagonist, this novel. And uh, again, I didn't set out for that to happen, but it was kind of um, a consequence of the, um, the structure of how I, I wanted to go about um, getting you know in, in a sense the serial killer is um is not the real bad guy and um and so he needed to be prominent but he was um it's, it's not that it was i'm not it's not a kansas city shuffle you know fake high go low kind of thing or anything like that but um but it was it, it became obvious to me that for me the main person in this novel is is joe for many other readers, it's Murphy, the homicide detective. And in fact, for I hope I'm not betraying a confidence from, from Ruby, but my copy editor, um, but for her, she, you know, her, her dark secret at the end of the copy editing process, say, actually, for me, it's, it's Sylvia, is what she told me. So, um, you know, so they, they've got different, um, different emphases in there. And so it means that there's no one single main person whose development you're tracking and in fact the serial killer is not really developing he's coming apart he doesn't just proceed unchanged but um he um you know he he's sort of he's he's the least um uh sort of um identifiable i guess character in there uh, in terms of identifying as a reader to the to the character and uh you know and the homicide detective he you know he, he gets um more and more stressed out and uh and the whole thing just goes on and on and he's under so much pressure he changes as well but so do so do the other two and it's not so much a quest narrative though um for me this book um i might write something like that one day but um this one's more about you know one of the things i really love about crime as a as a genre is um you know you take ordinary people or you know pretty ordinary people and put them into extraordinary circumstances and then see what happens. And, um, and that's, you know, a lot of fiction works like that, but crime is particularly good at it. And, and I guess for me, it's, it's less about a quest in terms of trying to achieve something or, or, get, or achieve a goal as it is to um, find some clarity in themselves about the resources they've got to get through this, you know, the resources they've had all along, but that they've been in their own way or that they've been unclear on exactly what they need to do. And so finding that way through. So it's not so much, um, yeah, the, the hero's journey as, um, as, you know, it's almost like, um, you know, you're batting for a draw at the end of a test match, some of these in, in some respects. It's, it's not so much about trying to win the match, it's just about not getting out. Uh, you know, before the end of play on day five. And so some of it's just that it's, it's kind of a little less, in some ways it's less dramatic than the hero's journey and, and more subtle, but there's more at stake in some way. It's not a, it's not a finding a grail, it's just survival. And so that's a, that's a pretty high stakes um, kind of game as well. 
Um, and then I've also had a question, uh, did publishing this book change the process of writing? Um, well, it, it is my, um, my debut, so um, I guess I am underway writing again. Um, that's a really good question. I don't think it has actually come to think of it. Um, yeah, I'm, I guess, um, I guess the, the, the difference between the first one and, and what comes next is, um, well, there's a couple, and one of them is a line that uh, my local bookseller here, uh, Nina, at the Brunswick Street Bookstore uh, in Fitzroy, she always said, you know, you get the first one for free and then, then it gets harder. You know, you've got to come up with, um, with new ideas, uh, not the one that's been following you around for 20 years that you've been embroidering in your head so you know exactly what happens when you sit down to write for the first time. Uh, now that, uh, you know, I've got to sort of start a little with a little less um, material already going. I've got ideas that have been following me around for a long time, but I haven't, I've been focusing on this book instead, so I haven't, they're not as uh, well developed. But the other thing that's different is time. You know, I had no deadline when I wrote this. I could take as long as I wanted. I got a, I got a publishing contract um, and I said to them, you know, I've got a full-time job. It's a pretty full-on job and I'm going to have to, I will devote my spare time to this, but it's going to be episodic. And so let's be realistic about that. And so they, they were, they heard that and, uh, and took that into account. But, um, you know, I'm going to have to really get on with it um, to publish something in a reasonable time frame again now. Uh, and fortunately, I've been able to drop down to part-time paid work. And so, um, so now I'll, I will have more time to get on with it. But, but that's, I guess that's the other difference is that I played around a lot with different ideas, um, you know, and, uh, and so I guess, um, you know, there's, I, I might have to be a little bit more uh, ruthless about the, the extent to which I indulge ideas that are starting to maybe not work out, but to kill my darlings a little earlier. Um, that, and the other thing I will not do is I will not present a, a panel of judges with a 160,000 word manuscript, um, which is what I did to, uh, to those, those poor people who were the, the Victoria, who read on behalf of the Victorian Premier. Um, so I won't do that again. So, um, you know, I guess, I guess there are th a few things you learn, but, um, but one of the things that I already knew that I've had in reinforced that's really relevant is, is just that thing about trusting editing as a process. I mean, I actually really quite enjoy editing, which I'm told is bizarre and sick, but um, I do. Uh, but it also, I also had a really great editing process with, with my copy editor and the publisher as well at a firm. And, and that enables you to take some punts on things knowing that there's plenty of opportunities later to clean it up if it doesn't quite work, uh, or even if it's a fairly major thing, you can find another way through if it, and you can get a good second, you know, objective opinion about it. Uh, just, just keep going, just have a go. And so I, I guess I find it easy to flow because of that. And the process of publishing didn't change that for me, but it, it confirmed for me that I was right to have that, uh, that perspective from the start. Um, and then now Julianne's asked, do I have time to, <clears throat> to read, to finish with a little bit of reading? We've got six minutes. It's not very much time. Um, and I wonder, maybe I'll, um, I'll read a little bit um, from the begin near the beginning when um, Joe, <clears throat> Joe was uh, just finishing off a, a lecture at... Um, at Sydney Uni, and uh, it's a public lecture, and it's on Vesalius and um, and uh, Hans Holbein the Younger, who who was Henry VIII's portraitist. But prior to living in England, he um, he lived in in Basel for a while and painted a few um, quite remarkable pictures there. Uh, they still hang there, and one of them is um, the Dead Christ in His Tomb, and it's mentioned by uh, Dostoevsky in his novel The Idiot, as, uh, and Dostoevsky characterises it as a painting that can make a man lose his faith. Um, so this, this painting is written about by a lot of other people. Julia Kristeva wrote about it um, and, uh, and, and a few others. And so, um, and so it's, but it's very anatomical. And so there's that, uh, that element of, um, of the connection there. And so she's just done this, um, this lecture, and I'm just sort of setting the scene of introducing these, the, my two women characters. <clears throat> so, 
um, Monday the 30th of April evening. That was great, Joe. Dr. Joanna King had just delivered a public lecture at Sydney University on the depictions of the body in art and science. She smiled at her sister-in-law. Thanks for coming, Sylvia. Wouldn't have missed it. Sorry about Dave, he was held up at work. Joe shrugged. Her brother was a homicide detective, so he often went missing, but went with the territory. Is that all right? Not too academic? Not at all. You pitched it perfectly. Everybody loved it. Yes, we did, said an elderly woman who'd approached. Sorry to interrupt, Professor King, but I wanted to thank you for such an engaging lecture. Well, I'm not a professor, but thank you so much. Well, you should be. You're an interesting thinker and a clear speaker, not like these scrawny old roosters they wheel out. They wouldn't know an original idea if it bit them on the bum. Sylvia smirked unhelpfully, but Joe just gave a diplomatic smile. You're very kind. Keep at it, dear. Your time will come. Those old coots can't live forever. The elderly woman patted Joe's forearm before making way for a nervy, intense man who'd been hovering at her shoulder, barely suppressing his agitation. That was exceedingly interesting, Dr. King. Thank you. He was clutching an art book of the Vesalius woodcuts tightly to his chest. Most informative and a daring hypothesis, if you don't mind me saying. Thank you, replied Joe. I see you're something of an admirer yourself. Oh, yes, he was the greatest mind of his time. Joe's eyebrows shot up. That's quite a claim. Copernicus, da Vinci, Michelangelo, Erasmus and Galileo all overlapped with Vesalius. Oh, I'm not belittling his contemporaries, said the man. They were titans. But the master's legacy is far more profound than the historians generally allow for mine. Present company accepted, of course. You may have a point, said Joe, not missing the enthusiast's title of master for his hero. The man leaned in, glancing aside at the others waiting. I should be grateful if we were to discuss this in further depth, at your convenience, of course. This time it was Sylvia who raised her eyebrows, but Joe felt confident that this was only the innocent, if socially inept advance of a slightly obsessed hobbyist. All the same, this was not her first rodeo. Why don't you give me your phone number? Perhaps we can arrange a coffee. I'd be very grateful, he said, pulling out a notepad and inscribing a heavily underlined Vesalius, followed by his name and number. It's always refreshing to find a like mind, don't you think? He tore out the page and handed it to her. Joe looked at the sheet. I look forward to it, Mr. Porter. He laughed. Stephen, please. A woman at his elbow cleared her throat and gave him a nudge. Well, I must be off. I look forward to hearing from you, Dr. King. Good night. Joe smiled faintly at the odd man as he wheeled away, then turned to the next in line. She chatted briefly with a few more loiterers before Sylvia leaned in and said to the others, I'm terribly sorry, but we really have to go now. Joe smiled her regret and bundled her papers into a seasoned leather messenger bag. They made their escape, strolling through the mild autumn evening towards Sylvia's car on City Road. Good crowd, said Sylvia. You even brought out the train spotters. He was a bit strange, wasn't he? You're not going to call him, are you? Not likely. I'm sure he's harmless enough, but you never can tell. Well, you struck a chord anyway. The punters loved it. I hope I got the balance right. It wasn't too artsy. Not at all. From a nurse's point of view, you hit the mark, Sylvia assured her as they got in the car. Stop angsting about it, Professor. Joe stuck her tongue out and laughed. They drove to Sylvia's place in Ramwick and went through to the big open living room at the back of the house. Sylvia dumped her keys in a gigantic mortar bowl that Joe had given them as a housewarming present. Its heavy marble pestle lived by the front door in a drawer on the, of the hall table. Her husband said that he liked to have a weapon in every room. Tea? Actually, I could use a drink. Joe slumped into the sofa with a sigh. Now you're talking, what'll it be? Do you have any of that Spanish black sherry? Always. Sylvia found a bottle of Pedro Jimenez and a couple of sherry glasses. So did you end up calling that bloke from last week? She asked Joe while she poured. They'd been to see the Audreys and met a couple of nice fellas who'd shared their table during the set break. One of them had given Joe his phone number at Sylvia's covert suggestion. No, he wasn't my type. She was still wary of intimacy with men since her breakup the year before, and with women for that matter. Humans, generally. Didn't leave a lot of options. Maybe she needed a pet. What do you mean? He was lovely, said Sylvia, handing Joe her sherry. You had heaps in common. Oh, it all just feels so pointless, Sylv. Joe shrugged and looked into her glass. I mean, how do you even reach people? But you have to try, Joe. Otherwise, how would anyone connect? Yeah, but it just takes so much energy. Then most of the time, it all comes to nothing anyway. Sometimes I wonder how anyone can be bothered. You know what I mean? 
Sylvia was shaking her head at Joe's bleak assessment when the front door opened way up the hallway. Ahoy, my hearties, anybody aboard? Came the cry. The women looked at each other, parking the conversation for another time. You're just in time for a drink, Sylvia called back. Murphy bustled into the room, which suddenly seemed to shrink around him. Christ, I could do with one, he said. Landed some new business today. He took off his jacket and then shrugged off his shoulder holster, depositing it in one of the kitchen drawers, revolver and all. He came into the lounge room and leaned down to kiss his wife. Joe's lecture was brilliant tonight, Sylvia told him as he pulled away. Oh, great, he said, kissing his sister on the cheek. What was it on again? He crossed to the sideboard to add his own keys to the mortar and withdrew a beer from the built-in bar fridge. A painting by Hans Holbein the Younger, the body of the dead Christ in the tomb. Dostoevsky made a fuss about it. Was he your PhD guy? Asked Murphy as he flopped onto the armchair. No, that was Vermeer. Holbein was Henry VIII's official painter. So what about this painting? I have a theory about its influence on Andreas Vesalius. Who's that? Oh, nobody, only the founder of modern European anatomy. All right, smart ass. And what was it in aid of? This new arts meets science outreach program the uni's running. It was a big deal to be invited to deliver it, Sylvia said pointedly. Sorry, I missed it, said Murphy, but new customers always have priority. His expression turned serious. Shit. He lunged for the remote and switched the television on. Joe thought he'd be checking the news regarding his new homicide case. But no. I forgot about the replay. He flicked the channels until he found the rugby league. I missed the Anzac Day game last week. You girls don't mind, do you? The women exchanged a look. Too bad if we do. Joe finished her sherry and tilted her head towards the front door. Sylvia nodded. Walk you home? Joe only lived 15 minutes away in Coogee. Well, 15 minutes there, 20 back. There was a decent hill in between. Sylvia could do with the stretch. You can stay, sis. Murphy's eyes were glued to half a dozen shiny white arses, all heaving and flexing, straining against an opposing knot of dark blue. No, I've got a stack of essays to mark. Righto then, see ya. His eyes didn't leave the screen. Joe came around in front of Murphy, deliberately blocking his view, and leant down to kiss him on the crown of his head. See ya, bro. Oh, for... Murphy ducked his head to the side to keep the screen in view. Don't be long, Dahl, he told his wife. The Dragons won the scrum, but coughed it up immediately in a crunching tackle. A certain amount of chatter went on between the women folk in the background, so he turned up the volume. He heard the front door, then silence. He leapt up and grabbed another beer from the fridge without taking his eyes off the screen, but the roosters spun it out the back line fast, culminating in a bold cutout pass to the winger who barged over the try line right out wide. Fuck! Murphy bolted up the hall and changed into tracky jacks and an old bin tang t-shirt. He made it back for the conversion, an impressive kick from just inside the touchline. Fuck! He flopped onto the sofa, took a swig of beer and let out a fruity belch. This was more like it. So I like that scene, not just because you discover that, um, you know, Murphy is a St George Dragons fan, but also it's the one scene that's got all four of my characters in that in the, at the same time. So I'm going to leave it there, I think. Do we have any more questions to go? I think there's one more. Um, Oh, the character arc for my murder character, does he change in any way? Um, no, <laughs> he does remain a sociopath. Um, he's, the only way in which he changes through the book is um, he's, he starts to lose discipline a little bit. Um, he, he becomes rattled by how he, even a man with as much planning and as, as cold-blooded as he is, he becomes rattled at how his events, uh, how his actions um, have consequences in the world and the, the scale of that um, it sort of freaks him out a little bit and, he, and, um, and it's partly um, why he ends up getting caught really because he, he becomes a little bit um, uh, confused I guess so anyway you know, you'll have to read and see what you think but, um, but I think I'm going to leave it there Tracy and um, unless there are further questions um, that people want me to address before we go. It sounds great. Thanks so much, John. Looks like we've exhausted all of our questions tonight. Everybody's enthralled. Yeah, <laughs> well, hopefully they'll, they'll read it. And if they, if they already have, they'll recommend it. Um, I look forward to being able to come to Adelaide for real um, one of these days, uh, not, not too long, and hopefully um, get involved in some cultural activities down there because it's a really great cultural city. And uh, in the five years I lived there, I loved, you know, Writers Week and, uh, and the activities that go on um, in in. Uh, all over town um, and you know having um, 
you know, a lot of affection for the city. I'm really looking forward to being able to speak to readers face to face and uh, and maybe sign your book. So if you see me down there or anything, please please bring it up and I'll um I'll give you a signature in the front of your book. Yeah, we sure hope you'll come uh, to the festival state soon yeah. and tell us all about your new books yes. or books when they're published. So we look forward to hearing what they are. And thank you again so much for joining us uh, this evening, John, all the way from Melbourne and for sharing your book with us. It sounds absolutely fascinating as well as a little grisly. So I really yeah. look forward to reading that. So, uh, mm. And John's book can be purchased from any good local bookstore and you can borrow that in your library as well. Please keep and following the... Mar Sorry, go on, John. I was just going to say, don't wait for the movie to come out. We are talking with someone about, about a screen deal, but that kind of thing takes a long time. So read it first. It's always been oh, a that's read awesome. Book. That's yeah. great news though. Yeah. yeah. Uh, please keep following the Marion Library's Facebook page, the City of Marion website, and check your inbox to be kept up to date on all of the upcoming Library Through the Lens presentations and workshops. And as John mentioned earlier, if you haven't already registered, please join us on Wednesday the 10th of November as we welcome Charlotte Wood in conversation with Alsa Piper to discuss her new book, The Luminous Solution. We hope you'll join us then. And thanks again, John, and good night, everybody. Thank you. See ya.